Today's video is prompted by a reader's question and it's themed questions for the end times. The reader's question refers to the signs of the times and the events in the Book of Mormon repeating themselves. He wants a discussion on this topic. What's the first image that comes to mind when we think of the parallels between now and the Book of Mormon? This is the famous painting of Mormon and Moroni during their final stages of retreat. Is there any parallel to today on this? What are the signs? If we reflect on the chaos we're seeing in the media and the modern Elias church, my house is a house of order, saith the Lord God, and not a house of confusion. We're looking at a timeline here. We have, on one hand, we have the revisionist apostate professors, uh, the scholars, muddy in the waters. We contrast that to the original testimonies of the saints who knew Joseph Smith personally, as compared to today, the pretense that we don't know enough to, uh, about Joseph Smith. Therefore, we must come up with many theories and models and uh, write a book or come up with your own social media channel to profit off of that speculation. And where do we begin? Why is Joseph Smith the key as a starting point to any such discussion? This type of discussion you read or hear about on Joseph Smith is one of those signs we're talking about, signs of the end times. To understand the context of how to approach this question, you must first understand the restored gospel and our prophet's role in it. Do members of the LDS Church truly understand who Joseph Smith was and the role he was assigned in this last dispensation? Why did Joseph Smith teach as much as he did regarding the celestial kingdom. If you understand these questions and understand them in depth, it'll give you more insight to interpret these end times and the signs we're seeing going on. What are some of the important reasons Joseph Smith taught principles of the celestial kingdom? Would he have taught of the potential of man reaching Godhead status without full understanding of his own role and destiny in the Lord's plan? So who really was Joseph Smith? If you study him enough, you realize he was someone who had minor flaws. He was not a majorly flawed man. What did he repent about in his life? Well, he said he was a little exuberant in his youth, perhaps. Who was he hanging out with in, in his teen, teenage years? How was he behaving? And he, he repented only on those minor things um, in how he was not as serious as we would have hoped him to be if he was a prophet. So what is the true meaning of the commandment to follow in the Lord's footsteps? To take up his cross? What would it mean to truly emulate the Savior and succeed? If our Lord commands us to do this and we pay the price that God would pay in this world, what can we expect after we pass from this life? To understand the signs of the times as they pertain to the gospel in a general discussion, we were talking about Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith had mentioned he had been accused of many things, but the things he repented of were not what he was accused of. What signs of the times are we seeing? And are the events in the Book of Mormon repeating themselves? Understand the father of deception seeks to take anything of value from you. In this time of history we have many influences from social media and the internet. Anti-Mormons today have more opportunity than they ever have to make a lucrative living using Satan's deception. You see these podcasts all over YouTube. They're set up so that unsuspecting members of the church often find themselves vulnerable to Satan and the tactics of his servants on these YouTube channels. Using the deception 
to undermine their understanding of the gospel. This often leads to apostasy. The anti-Mormons then substitute those figurative rocks of nourishment for nothing, or in other words, nothingness, in place of what used to be a church member's testimony of the gospel. As we look around in the world today and in the media, we see these innocent looking red flags, the small ones among the church members, that we wonder what would happen if they were triggered, the little things that caused a little bit of doubt here and there, wondering if Joseph Smith did have more flaws than they had imagined. Often they don't consider that maybe Joseph Smith was the most righteous man we've seen in the last 2,000 years since Christ. What would cause church members to reject the church and gospel? And could it happen en masse? Could we see a large apostatizing in the LDS church? And it kind of brings to mind that fictional Order 66 in the science fiction movie. Is that something that's possible to have happen today? where something triggers a lot of people's doubts and makes them question more than more. It seems like we're being set up for that. That's the only reason why I brought in a, a fictional story there. But if we were to predict what's in the future, why would that not happen? With so many people with weakened testimonies, so many people don't understand Joseph Smith and his purpose in the world. And what comes to mind here are the parallels between Mormon and Moroni trying to hold on as long as they could and the saints in the modern LDS church attempting to keep the gospel and truth of Joseph Smith alive. The best way to understand the signs of the times is to know the gospel restored by Joseph Smith and the prophecies of the Book of Mormon. First and foremost, the Book of Mormon was written by the ancestors of the modern day Native Americans. And their hopes were first and foremost for their descendants. What did the leaders and associates of Joseph Smith say about him? How do we treat this man, Joseph Smith, who lived a life the Savior finds worthy of celestial kingdom status? That man, Joseph Smith, has achieved that glory. If you, if you see what has been said in church leaders' talks and statements since Joseph Smith was lost to the church. Those men who knew him knew exactly who he was. He had reached that celestial kingdom status. They went out of their way to explain how important Joseph Smith was to the, all the inhabitants of the world, particularly those who personally knew Joseph Smith. This quote of Joseph Smith is commonly cited, quote, people little know who I am when they talk to me and they never will know until they see me weighed in the balance of the kingdom of God. Then they will know who I am and see me as I am. I dare not tell them and they do not know me. Recently we've seen some indication there is a spiritual awakening in parts of the church. People are starting to speak again about the greatness of Joseph Smith and his calling in life. And then, and then you take this quote, he said, he does not dare tell who he is. He knows who he is. He is someone, you would call him a blasphemer if he actually told you who he is. Now, we don't worship Joseph Smith, but he did reach Godhead status. The answer to understanding any interpretation of end time signs hinges on this question then of understanding the greatness and significance of who Joseph Smith was. Do his words indicate self-awareness of what they imply, meaning God had status? If Joseph Smith was this kind of heavenly being and his close associates knew this, wouldn't it be natural to assume there were many who desired a spiritual ceiling to Joseph Smith and his family? Joseph Smith's family itself was targeted, and sadly and tragically, they did not come west with the main body of the church. However, what about the members, the thousands of descendants of the women sealed to Joseph Smith? How about 
their blessings and those that were passed down through the generations to Joseph Smith's spiritual descendants through his sealed wives. Of course, we're not talking about worshiping Joseph Smith as the church has been accused of. No one prays to him. He'll have his own world. Joseph Smith couldn't help being who he was and what he was sent to the world to do. And the knowledge and awareness of his great calling could be an almost unbearable burden to him at times. What did leaders and associates of Joseph Smith say about him? Joseph Smith holds the keys of this last dispensation. This is Brigham Young speaking and is now engaged behind the veil in the great work of the last days. I can tell our beloved brother Christians who have slain the prophets and butchered and otherwise caused the death of the death of thousands of Latter-day Saints, the priests who have thanked God in their prayers and thanksgiving from the pulpit that we have been plundered, driven, and slain, and the deacons under the pulpit and their brethren and sisters in their closets who have thanked God, thinking that the Latter-day Saints were wasted away, something that no doubt will mortify them, something that, to say the least, is a matter of deep regret to them, namely, that no man or woman in this dispensation will ever enter into the celestial kingdom of God without the consent of Joseph Smith. From the day that the priesthood was taken from the earth to the winding up scene of all things, Every man and woman must have the certificate of Joseph Smith Jr. as a passport to their entrance into the mansion where God and Christ are. I with you and you with me. I cannot go there without his consent. He holds the keys of that kingdom for the last dispensation, the keys to rule in the spirit world. And he rules there triumphantly, for he gained full power and a glorious victory over the power of Satan while he was yet in the flesh, and was a martyr to his religion and to the name of Christ, which gives him a most perfect victory in the spirit world. He reigns there as a supreme, a being in his spirit, capacity, and calling, as God does in heaven. Many will exclaim, Oh, that is very disagreeable. It's preposterous. We cannot bear the thought, but it is true. How about a quote from Orson Pratt? I had the great privilege when I was in for my missions of boarding the most of the time at his house, so that I not only knew him as a public teacher, but as a private citizen, as a husband and father. I witnessed his earnest and humble devotions both morning and evening in his family. I heard the words of eternal life flowing from his mouth, nourishing, soothing, and comforting his family, neighbors, and friends. I saw his countenance lighted up as the inspiration of the Holy Ghost rested upon him, dictating the great and most precious revelations now printed for our guide. I saw him translating by inspiration. The Old and New Testaments and the inspired Book of Abraham from Egyptian Papyrus. That's Journal of Discourses 7176. A quote from John Taylor. No wonder that Joseph Smith should say that he felt himself shut up in a nutshell. There was no power of expansion. It was difficult for him to reveal and communicate the things of God because there was no place to receive them. What he had to communicate was so much more comprehensive, enlightened, and dignified than that which the people generally knew and comprehended. It was simple. It was difficult for him to speak. He felt fettered and bound, so to speak, in every mood he made. So it is to the present time. Yet this being a fact, and these being part of the things we expect to accomplish, there must be a beginning somewhere, and if the chips do fly once in a while when the hewer begins to hew, and if we do squirm once in a while, it is not strange because it is so difficult for the people to comprehend the things which are for their benefit. 
We have been brought up so ignorantly and our ideas and views are so contracted it is scarcely possible to receive the things of God as they exist in his bosom. There's a, a main point of this quote explaining Joseph Smith had a lot to say but the people were not ready to understand what he had to say. He had knowledge of depth but he had to simplify as in speaking to a small toddler child to to teach a, just a small part of what he wanted to teach it's because the people were not capable of understanding so when you hear modern scholars or anyone quote well Joseph Smith was a simple farm boy he couldn't have known this this or this maybe you should pause and consider that is not reflective of who Joseph Smith really was it's disrespectful and a dis discredit to Joseph Smith to not show him the proper respect that maybe he did know. People tend to build themselves up by putting Joseph Smith down with these sayings that we're hearing more and more. Joseph Smith probably didn't understand this, so it's up to these smarter scholars of today to research and figure it out for him. Nothing could be further from the truth. Another quote from John Taylor. Joseph Smith, in the first place, was set apart by the Almighty according to the counsels of the gods in the eternal worlds. To introduce the principles of life among the people of which the gospel is the grand power and influence, and through which salvation can extend to all peoples, all nations, all kindreds, all tongues, and all worlds. It is the principle that brings life and immortality to light and places us in communication with God. God selected him for that purpose and he fulfilled his mission and lived honorably and died honorably. I know what I speak for I was very well acquainted with him and was with him a great deal during his life and was with him when he died. The principles which he had placed him in communication with the Lord and not only with the Lord but with the ancient apostles and prophets, such as men, such men, for ex instance, as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Adam, Seth, Enoch, and Jesus, and the Father, and the apostles that lived on this continent, as well as those who lived on the Asiatic continent. He seems to be as familiar with these people as we are with one another. Jo John Taylor knew Joseph Smith. This is not something he's saying off the top of his head. That's quite a quote. Joseph Smith knew these apostles. He knew these biblical characters, the biblical figures. He seemed to be as familiar with these people as we are with people we know. It's something to pause and consider the knowledge Joseph Smith had if he had that kind of acquaintance. Another quote from John Taylor, Moses, when he appeared to Joseph Smith, committed to him the keys of the dispensation of the gathering of Israel from the four quarters of the earth and the restitution of the ten tribes. Read it in the Doctrine and Covenants. It is there plainly written. Why are you here today from Scandinavia and other parts of the world? Because God has, among other dispensations, restore the dispensation of the gathering in relation to other matters was there a time to transpire that elijah should come to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers that elias has come and has introduced that dispensation here's a quote from parley p pratt i have testified and do still testify of the truth of the book of mormon that it is an inspired record, the history of a branch of the House of Israel that live in America, and that it does contain the fullness of the gospel as revealed to them by a crucified and risen Redeemer, and that wherever it goes and its light is permitted to shine, the Spirit of the Lord will bear testimony of its truth to every honest heart in all the world. Wherever that book is candidly perused, the Spirit will bear record of its truth. 
And I bear this testimony this day that Joseph Smith was and is a prophet, seer, and revelator, a, an apostle holding the keys of this last dispensation and of the kingdom of God under Peter, James, and John. And not only that he was a prophet and apostle of Jesus Christ and lived and died one, but that he now lives in the spirit world and holds those same keys to us word and to this whole generation. Also, that he will hold those keys to all eternity and no power in heaven or on the earth will ever take them from him. For he will continue holding those keys through all eternity and will stand, yes, again in the flesh upon this earth as the head of the Latter-day Saints under Jesus Christ and, and under Peter, James, and John. That's Journal of Discourses, Volume 5, page 195. Statement from George Buchanan, None Could Comprehend the Prophet, the prophet Joseph Smith. There are many, perhaps all of us, that have more or less of a desire to conform to the ideas which prevail in the world. These ideas we have inherited, and they come natural to us, and not having progressed sufficiently to overcome them, we naturally lean toward them. We do this in politics, in finance, in trading, in almost everything. It seems to be right to us because all of our inherited tendencies are in that direction. If we could have a glimpse of heaven and understand things as they are, we might be able to do better. But this is not God's way of doing things. He wants us to work out our own development and to exert the powers we have inherited from Him in conquering the wrong tendencies we have inherited from our fathers. He gives us line upon line, precept upon precept, and here or there, here a little, there a little. But he does not reveal it all at once. At the same time, he would like us to comprehend more than we do. I have sometimes thought that the prophet Joseph, with the knowledge he possessed and the progress he had made, could not stay with the people. So slow were we to comprehend things, and so enshrouded in our ignorant traditions. The saints could not comprehend Joseph Smith. If, if they could not comprehend Joseph Smith when he was alive and they knew him, how could they possibly comprehend him in the year 2023 when this is recorded? That's just something I have interjected. Back to the quote, The elders could not. The apostles could not. They did so a little towards the close of his life, but his knowledge was so extensive and his comprehension so great that they could not rise to it. We don't hear quotes like this anymore in the modern church. We are hearing more quotes along the lines of, maybe Joseph didn't understand, maybe he had flaws. Well, they assume he did have flaws. Uh, a lot of uh, elevated... People with high offices in the church will even qualify their testimonies of Joseph Smith. Talking about him as if he were ignorant. That's directly contradicting what these church leaders have said in these previous slides. Heber C. Kimball predicted a test. An army of elders will be sent to the four quarters of the earth to search out the righteous and warn the wicked of what is coming. All kinds of religions will be started and miracles performed that will deceive the very elect if that were possible. Our sons and daughters must live pure lives so as to be prepared for what is coming. After a while the Gentiles will gather by the thousands to this place and Salt Lake City will be classed among the wicked cities of the world. Is that the case now? That's all I'm asking. A spirit of speculation and extravagance will take possession of the saints, and the results will be financial bondage. Persecution comes next, and all true Latter-day Saints will be tested to the limit. Many will apostatize, 
and others will still will be still not knowing what to do darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness the minds of the people the judgments of God will be poured out on the wicked to the extent that our elders from far and near will be called home or in other words the gospel will be taken from the Gentiles and later on carried to the Jews the western boundary of the state of Missouri will be swept so clean of its inhabitants that as President Young tells us when you return to that place there will not be left so much as a yellow dog to wag his tail before that day comes however the Saints will be put to a test that will try the integrity of the best of them the pressure will be will become so great that the more righteous among them will cry unto the Lord day and night until deliverance comes before that day comes however the Saints will be put to a test that will try the integrity of the best of them the pressure will become so great that the more righteous among them will cry unto the Lord day and night until deliverance comes. Then the prophet Joseph and others will make their appearance and those who have remained faithful will be selected to return to Jackson County, Missouri and take part in the building of that beautiful city, the New Jerusalem. This was the quote in the Deseret News, May 1868, or also repeated May 23rd 1931 it was also in the conference report October 1930 page 58 and 59 here's uh, more versions of the same quote but just more details I want to say to you my brethren the time is coming when we will be mixed up in these now peaceful valleys to the extent that it will be difficult to tell the face of a saint from the face of of an enemy to the people of God then brethren look out for the great sieve for there will be a great sifting time and many will fall for I say unto you there is a test a test a test coming and who will be able to stand this church has before it many close places through which it must pass before the work of God is crowned with victory to meet the difficulties that are coming it will be necessary for you to have knowledge of the truth of this work for yourselves just to pause here the question to start this topic in this video was to discuss the end times is there parallel to the Book of Mormon that discussion is very difficult to have if you do not have a knowledge of the truth of this work the gospel as restored through Joseph Smith if you do not have an understanding of the greatness of Joseph Smith, this conversation is very difficult, almost impossible. These are men that knew Joseph Smith personally. They understood the greatness of Joseph Smith and therefore could pass through and understand what this work is all about. Back to the quote, Heber C. Kimball. The difficulties will be of such character that the man or woman who does not possess this personal knowledge or witness will fall. If you have not got the testimony, live right and call upon the Lord and cease not till you obtain it. If you do not, you will not stand. This is uh, the Life of Heber C. Kimball's book uh, written by Orson F. Whitney. There was various printings of that. Remember these sayings. It's the same thing. The time will come when no man or woman will be able to endure unborrowed light. Each will have to be guided by the light within themselves. If you do not have the knowledge that Jesus is the Christ, how can you stand? Question, how does one obtain this knowledge and testimony of Christ Heber C. Kimball refers to? If there's a listener that is confused by any of this, it doesn't relate to it, here's the section where we talk about that. For those who feel this doesn't pertain to you or you can't relate to it, or perhaps there will be a time when you do try to get 
close to this knowledge and this testimony. And unfortunately, as to when, when is the most likely time for many to seek the Lord's Spirit? It is when, unfortunately, many will find it themselves in a crisis. And it happens in their lives. And then that is when they attempt to get closer to the Savior. Sometimes it is. That sense of despair that causes you to cry out for comfort and healing and help and whether or not you have had a strong testimony prior, you need to continually do those things to nourish and strengthen your testimony. Often uh, people have said it's a sense of desperation. It's a sense of praying asking the Lord what can I do as an instrument in your hands nothing else at this point matters willing to give your life to him as the saying goes allowing yourself to be used as an instrument for the message of the Lord we all need mutual prayers to help us heal from our travails and need a spark of life in the church to gain momentum and get stronger Again, we talked about earlier, people will qualify their testimony of Joseph Smith with a preface such as, although Joseph Smith had his flaws, here's what I believe that makes him a prophet. When you hear people talk like this, and they want to say something positive, but they're embarrassed to say something positive about Joseph Smith, they have to mention that he, in their, in their opinion, had flaws and he was a flawed man. They have heard some anti-Mormon information that has taken over a small part of their brain. They, they may still feel they have a testimony. But when you hear people talk like this, you know, you will know, you're in the presence of a church member in the early throes of apostasy. apostasy. We're talking about Joseph Smith's flaws. They were so minor, there's not a person in this world that wouldn't want to trade those flaws with Joseph Smith if they truly knew and understand him. We have those many thousands of descendants of the women sealed to the prophet Joseph Smith, and possibly some still have these teachings in their family. Those teachings regarding the significance of blessings of being sealed to Joseph Smith. These previous generations in your family, going back to those pioneer days, possibly have passed these teachings along, what it means to be sealed to someone for time and eternity. The perfect example to our work is Christ. We are commanded to follow his example and walk in his footsteps. If we, if we are aware of uh, the servant of the Lord, his chosen servant, Joseph Smith, why would we not want to have some sealed connection to Joseph Smith in some way if we truly understand his greatness, his celestial calling, his ruler as of the spirit world, as was mentioned by one of the church presidents? We are not commanded to follow or, nor worship others, but what about Joseph Smith? What about the man who does provide an example of walking in the Savior's footsteps with very minor flaws, if we can call them flaws at all. If you call exuberance of a, of a young person a flaw that needs to be repented of, well, what are your sins in comparison? How do we treat Joseph Smith? How do we treat him who lived a life the Savior finds acceptable? Doctrine and Covenant says in section 88, verse 68, Therefore, sanctify yourselves that your minds become single to God, and the days will come that you shall see him. For he will unveil his face unto you, and it shall be in his own time, and in, and in his own way, and according to his own will. We live in a day when enemies of the church and gospel seek to find any reason possible to come after the church and discredit the church. You've even seen lawsuits of some sort or another. And some of those are simply taking advantage of a political gaffe, perhaps, or some sort of thing uh, they heard 
read the language of a lawsuit, you'll you can usually predict how it's going to turn out if it's reckless, emotional. Of course, there are serious issues. We don't want to ever be accused of defending the, the terrible things that have occurred that people rightfully take legal action about. But those are a case-by-case -case basis. Satan himself, he'll seek a reversal on any positive publicity a good work might receive. To give it a stain and stigma that will drive people away from supporting good causes. Those whose minds are not clouded by taking this anti-Mormon bait and believe in the Gospels restored and taught by Joseph Smith, those seem to be few. However, they are uh, in the church. We, we are seeing some signs that there's awakenings in the church. People are getting a little bit fed up with the revisionist history and some of the corrupt teachings that have entered in the universities, uh, church-owned universities. A lot of those people are finally realizing it's either Joseph Smith or it's nothing. If Joseph Smith is flawed as they imagine, if he made mistakes, if he is to be discredited, if there's something about him that brings him down, that brings the church down, it brings the gospel down. Joseph Smith was the Lord's chosen servant to bring this work about. Those people who do understand this will have to band together rather than be scattered and isolated as it seems now. But how is it possible to help the misguided firm up their testimony on Joseph Smith and the restored gospel without being vulnerable to the cacophony dominating the landscape of the current LDS church? Questions will arise and are arising. One will ask, what will it take? How will we defend against the anti-Mormons seeking to discredit everything about the church? Seeking to discredit everything about the gospel restored under Joseph Smith. What needs to happen for the Lord to bless this nation? What needs to happen for the Lord to bless this church and this world? What will it take? To receive direction from the Lord, it requires that you desire the Lord's will and work of the Lord to be done regardless of any benefits you yourself may acquire and a steadfast determination that you will serve the Lord. There's ways to get closer to your Savior. It, it comes through prayer and repenting of, and having a sincere heart to do what's right, to do His will, to carry His message, do His works. What about Satan's agenda? The possible signs of his success. There's a video made on Satan's agenda, how to overthrow the LDS Church. Well, one thing that he's been very successful in doing is planting doubt in the LDS Church about Joseph Smith. Doubting Joseph Smith represents success in the eyes of Satan. You get that little bit of doubt. People are wondering about Joseph Smith. Somebody gave them an anti-Mormon story that they believe. They've discovered something 200 years later after he was in the prime of his life, is what they allege. And this, this hidden fact for 200 years now discredits Joseph Smith. No one ever figured it out until the, the latest anti-Mormon podcast came across it. That's how a lot of them worked on the minds of the vulnerable and the gullible saints who really probably never did have a testimony of the Gospel or Joseph Smith. A lot of them, now this is speculative, but they really didn't have the teaching that Joseph Smith was who he was. There was always that qualifier, as uh, some authorities like to put in there. They say, well, other than his flaws, Joseph Smith did something very great. That is someone that's already on the ro road. They, they're probably already an apostate when you hear them say that or talk like that. A lack of understanding of Joseph Smith is a lack of understanding of the gospel restoration under Joseph Smith. We look at what servants of Satan have accomplished to prevent these prophecies from being fulfilled. <clears throat> Their goal, they want to turn Joseph Smith into an ordinary man, ordinary flaws, ordinary intelligence 
one that commits big sins, as they themselves, likely his critics, are wont to do. When you hear people qualify their testimony of Joseph Smith with that preface that we've mentioned before, and, and then you will know, once again, you're in the presence of a church member in the early throes of apostasy. You're probably not going to have a clear conversation, one with clarity, because they always have to come back to their belief that Joseph Smith had flaws, and they are attempting to assign those flaws to Joseph Smith to allow their own ego and intellectual deficiency to feel on a more even playing field. Other signs. Well, we look at the address of King Benjamin and compare that to the modern church. That's probably uh, one of the better Book of Mormon comparisons. There's there's quite a bit of that sermon in the in the Book of Mormon, and it was a people that considered themselves very righteous, but by the end they would have been thoroughly humbled, realizing their insignificance in terms of the universe and the work in the gospel. So what does Satan intend? He wants to deny entire nations and continents of their promised blessings by finding ways to keep them in ignorance of how to find their true God and reclaim their blessings. So how do these servants of Satan enact their plan in and out of the church? And yes, they do infiltrate the church. Satan having taken the Main Street Church in, in what may be called, this is a word we hesitate to use, but when you are teaching an entire continent, they didn't have uh, original settlers of the Book of Mormon as Joseph Smith and the early church leaders taught. Why is that not racist? Why are we not seeing any protest to writing off an entire continent by some of the membership of the church going all the way up the hierarchy would this not be considered a spiritual genocide if it was in a world religion that had the majority of the world believing in it but this is a smaller religion it is the true religion but it's relatively small and a lot of people will simply react say well we didn't care anyway but it is false the falsehood being that the entire continent of South America is not where the Book of Mormon took place. The models and theories are created by the apostates or people, maybe they don't realize how, how far they have gone away from what this church has stood for and what Joseph Smith taught and what he died for. It's an insult to his life to let these little theories and models come forward. And so, yes, we're going to use the, the term, is this a racist direction against the blessings of the Native American people being denied? In Doctrine and Covenants section 42, this, this talks a little bit about the wealth of the church. It is destined to go to the Native Americans of both continents, both the North and South American continents, according to scripture. It's the term, I will consecrate of the riches. And so, if we see any signs of collapse, we may see that come to fruition. We don't want to, I don't want to speculate too far on that. But read Doctrine and Covenants 42. It does refer to consecrating the riches to his house of Israel, the Native Americans on the two continents. Whenever you see the term House of Israel in the Book of Mormon, a better way to understand that would be to substitute some form of the word Lamanite instead of House of Israel. Not out of disrespect, but just for comprehension purposes. The House of Israel refers to the Jacobites, and we have this all through the scripture. Descendants of Jacob, um, you know, other, other terms denoting the same thing. DNC 42. For inasmuch as you do it unto the least of these, you do it unto me. 
when you write off the blessings of an entire continent and seek to deny them their promised blessings and heritage. You're doing that to the Lord himself. Joseph Smith made it very clear this church was not constructed for the people currently occupying and controlling it. Verse 39, For it shall come to pass, that which I spake by the mouths of my prophets shall be fulfilled, for I will consecrate of the riches of those who embrace my gospel among the Gentiles unto the poor of my people who are of the house of Israel. More scriptures we'll look at will verify why that refers to the descendants of the Book of Mormon people, the house of Israel. We have that Kirtland blessing, the temple blessing, where Joseph Smith mentions how we, who are identified with the Gentiles, us, who are identified with the Gentiles, that is Doctrine and Covenants section 109, verse 60. That will help clarify how this Book of Mormon was framed and how it was viewed in the eyes of the people who lived it. These are prophecies to them that have come to pass. The Gentiles were to come and scourge and scatter the people. They would also have the church among the Gentiles. The purpose of that being among the Gentiles was to be carried to the house of Israel, the descendants of the Book of Mormon people. Verse 40, And again, thou shalt not be proud in thy heart, let all thy garments be plain, and their beauty the beauty of the work of thine own hands. The best way to understand the sins of the times, or the signs of the times, is to know the prophecies of the Book of Mormon. First and foremost, the Book of Mormon was written by the ancestors of the modern day Native Americans, and their hopes were first and foremost for their descendants, not for European descendants coming and taking the lands and uh, then a church being established among them. That's an injustice that will be corrected. Third Nephi 21, House of Israel, Native Americans, will be like a lion among the flocks of sheep. Verse 1, And verily I say unto you, I give unto you a sign that ye may know the time when these things shall be about to take place. That I shall gather in from their long dispersion of my people, O house of Israel, and shall establish again among them my Zion. Verse 2, And behold, this is the thing which I will give unto you for a sign. For verily I say unto you that when these things which I declare unto you, and which I shall declare unto you hereafter of myself, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, which shall be given unto you of the Father, shall be made known to the Gentiles, that they may know concerning this people who are a remnant of the house of Jacob. Uh, I emphasize that, of course, to illustrate what we have been talking about when we talk about this house of Israel. And concerning this, my people, who shall be scattered by them. For it is wisdom in the Father that they should be established in this land. And be set up as a free people by the power of the Father that these things might come forth from them unto a remnant of your seed and that the covenant of the Father may be fulfilled which he had covenanted with his people, O house of Israel. Now going back to the house of Jacob, of course uh, a lot of people will feel that's Jacob of the Bible, father of the twelve sons, son of Isaac, and I'm prepared to have that conversation. Of course there's Jacob who was the brother of Nephi. So that there clearly is a potential for misunderstanding what it, what it means, uh, who is the house of Jacob. We can have that conversation in another video if uh, it's requested. For thus it behooveth the Father that it should come forth from the Gentiles that he may show forth his power unto the Gentiles for this cause that the Gentiles, if they will not harden their hearts, that they may repent and come unto me and be baptized in my name 
and know the true points of my doctrine, that they may be numbered among my people, O house of Israel. For thus it behooveth the Father, that it should come forth from the Gentiles, that he may show forth his power unto the Gentiles, for this cause of the Gentiles, if they will not harden their hearts, that they may repent and come unto me and be baptized in my name and know of the true points of my doctrine, that they may be numbered among my people, O house of Israel. And my people who are a remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles, yea, in the midst of them as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who if he go down if he go through, both treadeth down, and teareth into pieces, and none can deliver. So what is Satan's agenda? Who in this current year teaches truth? We are seeing many continue to get lost in the cacophony of speculative theorizing on Joseph Smith, and then finding themselves misled, or becoming misled, the devil wants to continually discredit Joseph Smith in order to lead the church members to continue denying those truths of the restored gospel Joseph Smith gave us. But are we seeing a small awakening in the church as more seek out the facts about Joseph Smith? I believe we are. And we are seeing it even on social media. We're seeing a renewed defense of Joseph Smith. If you want to find the answers, that would be where to look. If you if you hear an authoritative source on Joseph Smith and defending his greatness, those are the people that you'll have the best chance of learning from how to survive this spiritual crisis. Heber C. Kimball has mentioned. Note that Joseph Smith did state he had those sins, and I, this has been talked about in this video. They were never what others might accuse him of. Those who attempted to project their own lack of understanding and perceptual death and evil inner projections on Joseph Smith ended up being completely inaccurate in their attempted portrayals. Whenever you see the term House of Israel, you need to substitute the word Lamanite for the House of Israel. That's just a recap. And why do we need to understand that the House of Israel refers to Native American inhabitants? Orson Pratt explains, Journal of Discourses 13, page 129. This book contains prophecies which affect every nation under heaven, prophecies that will be fulfilled on their heads. Can we read the future of this great American nation or great republic? Yes, we can learn a great many features within its pages concerning this nation and government that we never should have learned without its aid or the spirit of revelation. From it we learn that two great and powerful nations formerly dwelt on this continent. One nation, or rather the colony which founded it, came from the Tower of Babel. Soon after the days of the flood, they colonized what we call North America landing on the western coast. So we, when we talk about these many artifacts, a lot of them are these Jaredites. And it's, a, it's a little bit south of the Gulf of California, is where Orson Pratt's referring to, in the southwestern part of this north wing of our continent. They flourished some 1600 years. When they first colonized this continent from the Tower of Babel, the Lord told them if they would not serve him faithfully, but become ripe in iniquity, they should be cut off from the face of the land. That was fulfilled about 600 years before Christ, when they were entirely swept off. And in their stead the Lord brought a remnant of Israel, a few families, not the ten tribes, but a small portion of the tribe of Joseph. He's referring to Lehi's family here. There's also the family that came later. He brought them from Jerusalem, first down to the Red Sea. They traveled along the eastern borders of the Red Sea for many days, and then bore off in an eastern direction, which brought them to the Arabian Gulf. There they were commanded of the Lord to build a vessel. They went aboard of this vessel and were brought by the special providence of God across the great Indian and Pacific Oceans. So, 
again they came across the Pacific and landed on the west part of South America they landed on the western coast of South America this is about 580 years before the coming of Christ 11 years after the Lord brought this first colony of Israelites from Jerusalem he brought in another small colony headed by one of the sons of Zedekiah a descendant of King David so when we talk about the peoples in the Book of Mormon, that's it. I'm talking about this uh, colony headed by Zedekiah. They left Jerusalem the same year that the Jews were carried away captive into Babylon. They were brought forth to this continent and landed somewhere north of the Isthmus. Uh, sounds like Panama. They wended their way into the northern part of South America. About 400 years after this, the two colonies amalgamated in the northern part of South America, and they became one nation. Again, when you see this wickedness of writing off South America, we're, we're correcting dozens of years, original testimony, people who knew Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith taught it was South America, Lehigh landed where he landed. Okay, so this is this is a sin against the gospel to come up with these models I don't know what they're all called I know there's at least two that people argue about and both of them we just um, it's pointless to argue about it the model you need to believe in is the one taught by Joseph Smith and the early church leaders Orson Pratt says I oftentimes reflect back on the early period of my experience in this church having been baptized into the same only about five months after its first organization when there were but a very few individuals numbered with the saints I presume that all who belonged to the church at that time might occupy a small room about the size of 15 feet by 20 I then became intimately acquainted with the prophet Joseph Smith and continued intimately acquainted with him until the day of his death. I had the great privilege when I was in from my missions of boarding the most of the time at his house. This is a quote I had also uh, mentioned earlier. I witnessed his hun earnest and humble devotions both morning and in the evening with his family I heard the words of eternal life flowing from his mouth nourishing soothing and comforting his family neighbors and friends I saw his countenance lighted up as the inspiration of the Holy Ghost rested upon him dictating the great and most precious revelations now printed it for our guide I saw him translating by inspiration the Old and New Testaments and the inspired book of Abraham from Egyptian papyrus and what now is my testimony concerning that man founded upon my own personal observations it is the same today as it was when I first received the testimony that he was a prophet I knew that he was a man of God it was not a matter of opinion with me for I received a testimony from the heavens concerning that matter and without such a testimony it is difficult for us always to judge for no man can know of the things of God but by the Spirit of God Journal of Discourses volume 7 page 176 book of John chapter 10 verses 27 to 29 my sheep hear my voice and I know them they follow me and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. 